Now, when it comes to the study of human behavior, are we getting the full picture? Our next guest says no. Joseph Henrik is a Harvard professor of evolutionary biology, and he says that our understanding of human nature is skewed because the vast majority of people who volunteer to take part in studies come from the same crop, educated Westerners. And what's more, they are actually psychologically quite peculiar. Henrik spells it out in his new book, the weirdest people in the world. And he also tells it to our Walter Isaacson. Thank you, Christian and Professor Joseph Henrik. Welcome to the show. Oh, thanks. Good to be with you. First, let's explain what you mean by weird. Right. So weird is an acronym. It stands for Western Educated Industrialized Rich and Democratic. And two colleagues of mine, Ara Noren Zion and Steve Heine, we coined it back in 2010 when we wanted to refer to the vast body of, of subjects or participants that psychologists use to populate their experiments on which much of modern psychology is based. So it's a, a psychologically unusual population. Most of modern psychology takes people like us, I'll say, Westerners who are educated and literate and make psychological uh, uh, you know, abstractions and judgments uh, about them. Why is that a problem? Well, it turns out when we began to review the literature that not only are uh, these weird populations psychologically unusual, so, so there, there's variation around the world in psychology and they turn out to be at the extreme ends of the distribution on lots of different interesting and important psychological outcomes. Such as what? Well, so a big one is individualism. So how much people focus on themselves and their attributes, it affects things like overconfidence and self-esteem. Uh, inclination to conform to peers. There's variation there on which weird people are in the extreme. The role of guilt versus shame, which is something anthropologists have long noted are different across societies, but uh, weird people tend to be extreme on the guilt end of the spectrum. The use of intentionality and moral judgment. So how much you think about other people's internal mental states and intentions when judging them morally. And also things like trust in strangers and cooperation with strangers. Are these genetic traits? No, no, they're very much culturally learned. And the book is about all the different ways in which our institutions and other features of social life shape how we think. And the, the, one of the key ideas that comes from my prior work is that we evolved as a cultural species. So our minds adapt to the kind of affordances and constraints created by our institutions. So we end up thinking differently because of the kinds of institutions we, we encounter when we're growing up. You say that weird people, i.e. Western educated people, uh, tend to be more individualistic. Explain that. The idea is, is that weird people are more focused on themselves and on cultivating their own attributes, on becoming a kind of unique member of their society. And the reason I argue in the book is because in this world, you've got to go out and make your own friends and make your own uh, relationships, find your own spouse, find your own business partners from this, uh, you know, collection of other people who are playing the same game. In lots of societies over human history, uh, you've had these dense networks of social relationships. So you would rely on family and other kinds of relational ties to find business partners, create arranged marriages. So the idea is that by having these kinds of uh, kin-based relationships or marriage relationships and looking for people in your social network to build new kinds of relationships with, you end up with a dense network and trust becomes based on having network connections rather than cultivating a kind of dispositional trust. So that's one of the other things about weird people is they think in terms of dispositions. So he's either trustworthy or not trustworthy, as opposed to trustworthy if I'm connected to him and through my network. Well, isn't it more advantageous to trust people based on evidence rather than based on networks? Well, it all depends on the structure of your society. Uh, so in lots of places, if you were to just trust strangers, you would um, you know, be taken advantage of. And economists have actually done interesting studies looking at, you know, there's a kind of an optimal amount of trust you, sh you should have in other people based on how trustworthy the people you're likely to encounter are. And this idea is that a lot of human trust was built by extending these networks, but then to create the kind of modern world where we're more accustomed to this anonymous, impersonal interaction, we might move a lot, you've got to rely on this dispositional strategy. One of the most famous psychological tests is the marshmallow test, which sort of tests patience. In other words, are you willing to defer gratification by putting off having one marshmallow for the sake of having two or three later on? To what extent is that a difference across cultures? Yeah, so there's been recently found interesting differences in the willingness of children to wait for that second marshmallow, where how long they wait is a measure of their self-regulation. And researchers working in the U.S. and with Western populations have shown that that willingness, that ability to self-regulate, 
predicts staying in school uh, and savings and other kinds of things that require deferral of gratification later in life. Parallel work done by economists measuring tens of thousands of people in 80 different countries around the world shows that there's tremendous variation in people's willingness to defer gratification. So that's an advantage for us weird Western educated societies that uh, we've developed that cultural instinct? Yeah, but again, one of the things I point out in the book is that it really depends on uh, your social milieu. So uh, uh, an economist named Chris Blattman has done experiments or where they took some poor men in Liberia and trained them to have to be able to defer gratification more. So they put them through an eight week training and they showed they were able to increase their ability to defer gratification. And then it looked like they were beginning to save more and do some of the things that that leads you to. But then they lost their savings because uh, they were stripped, you know, they were, uh, the police took it away from them through corrupt tactics, or it was stolen from them. So it actually didn't pay in that environment to save and defer for the future. So it, it all depends on how your institutions work. A lot of times in kin base in, in societies, you invest in the future by investing in your relatives and friends. So if they have someone in their family gets injured and they need money for a medical procedure, you give them money and then you know in the future you're insured through your network of social relations and the goodwill you've built up by, by giving away. So it's just a different institutional system. To what extent did the Catholic Church have a role in breaking down this notion of familial relationships and uh, marriage within clans. Yeah, so I make the case in, in my book that the Catholic Church played a critical role, that Europe prior to the spread of Christianity through Northern Europe, places like Northern France and England, uh, Germany, the Netherlands, places like that, that these were tribal populations that would have had cousin marriage and uh, polygynous marriage, uh, clans or kindreds, and there's various lines of evidence for this, but it seems that the Catholic Church systematically broke these populations down into monogamous nuclear families. So they, begin impo they began imposing incest taboos, which prevented you from marrying first, initially first cousins, but then eventually this is stretched out to six cousins by around the year 1000. Polygynous marriages ended, no more sex slaves or concubinage. Um, and then things about inheritance are changed. So eventually you get the kind of monogamous nuclear families, which are quite unusual uh, in the world today in a kind of global and historical perspective, but they're present in Europe before 1500. So when they uh, uh, spring up in Europe around 1500, monogamous nuclear families, how does that change the way we behave? Well, it means by breaking people down into monogamous nuclear families, it forced Europeans to go out and build new kinds of institutions. So I argue that this was a gradual process that happened over centuries. And it's underway in several parts of Europe by around 1,000. And that's when you see the proliferation of voluntary associations. So you get things like guilds, universities, charter towns, where people are joining together with voluntary strangers to form social safety nets. So one of the main things that these kin-based institutions do throughout back into human history is take care of people when they're sick and when they're old, when you get injured, things like that. So people needed to figure out new ways to do that. So they began banding together with strangers. There's often a religious overtone. So the first guilds were religious mutual insurance societies. Early charter towns did the same kind of similar thing. But then they have to decide how they're going to organize themselves and how they're going to um, make decisions in the town. And so they begin to come up with representative governments. And this, this I really think, is, is encouraged by the fact that they're monogamous nuclear families, so you don't have clans or things like that. And you have a more individualistic psychology. So people are moving into the towns as individuals rather than bringing a large family. And that encourages the emergence of these more formal institutions based on representative governments and eventually democracy and voting and stuff like that. So you really see this take off in Europe. And one of the analyses I look at in the book is the more centuries that a region had under the church, the more likely they were to come up with representative democracy. If I had to come up with a mission statement for us weird people, i.e. Western educated enlightenment folks, I would take the second sentence of the Declaration of Independence, that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights. Parse that sentence for me. Well, I think the idea, uh, you know, we can understand a lot about that sentence if we recognize that there was already this pre-existing psychology that was in the heads of the guys that were coming up with this. 
the notion that we're individuals and that we have inside of us these, these rights or something. Where do these rights come from? The very notion that we're endowing individuals with rights which then propel their behavior or give them political powers is something that I think develops slowly and as a consequence of this kind of psychological evolution, evolutionary process I'm talking about. It's not evident to lots of other uh, populations and places in time that it makes sense to endow people with these individual rights from which we derive all kinds of other privileges and responsibilities as a consequence. This is, this is that dispositionalism I mentioned about how weird people think. Do you think, uh, given what's happening to Western democracies, the world could use uh, some more, or we in the West could use some more non-weird influences? Yeah, one of the cases I, I make in the book is that a lot of our capacity to innovate, both in terms of building new institutions and building technologies, comes from bringing in ideas from all different societies and kind of creating recombinations. So at the, at the end of the book, I need to explain the kind of massive proliferation of innovation that has occurred, say, since 1750, so typical starting date for the Industrial Revolution. And the case I make is that it's because of this kind of broad-based trust, the flow of individuals amongst different societies and between occupations, connection between higher and lower strata individuals, uh, leading to recombinations and then spreading ideas around the world. I mean, I think a lot of the strength of US, the US has been come from immigration. So I recently reviewed the literature on the effects of immigration on innovation measured as patents. And basically at every case, every time you turn up in uh, immigration, you turn up innovation because people from other places bring ideas. It recombines with ideas that the locals have and creates new stuff. You discuss a lot about in moral judgment, how we weird people spend a lot of time thinking about intent, intentionality. Why is that an important cultural distinction? Well, it's important from the from what I think causes it in the sense that if you are in a if you're in a dense network where you're you're going to pick partners who you have several connections to, then what's going to cause them to behave well is the fact that you're they're connected to you. So if they don't behave well in your business transaction, you know, you have all these people you can tell who know them and then you know, it'd be bad for them reputationally. But if you're just, if you're in this kind of more disconnected social world, you've got to try to figure out what are his intentions, what are his goals, what are his internal mental states, what's his disposition or hers. And that's going to then affect uh, your judgment about whether you want to go into business with them or marry them or, you know, do all these different kinds of things you might want to do. So you've got to make these more internalized assessments. Do you think that that accounts for the relative success that weird cultures have had in terms of economic development, literacy, innovation? Well, I, yeah, I definitely make the case that it's this shift in psychology that led to institutions like the kinds of economic institutions we have and the kinds of political institutions we have. Uh, and this, you know, I think this helps explain innovation in uh, Western societies, the Industrial Revolution, uh, why, why European militaries were so successful around the world after 1500, which of course had lots of awful and, and catastrophic consequences for lots of populations around the world. Um, but you have to explain why they were able to do it. And so this is a story about why they were able to do it, because this change in family led to a change in psychology, which led to the development of kinds of institutions which, which didn't arise in, in other places. One of the uh, amusing, tasty morsels in your book was a discussion of United Nations diplomats getting traffic tickets. Explain that. Yeah, so it was a uh, research done by two economists, uh, Ted Miguel and Ray Fishman. And what they did is they got all the unpaid uh, parking tickets for UN diplomats. So UN diplomats, 90% of them live within one mile of the UN compound in Manhattan. And up until 2002, after 9-11, they had diplomatic immunity. So they could park anywhere without having to pay the parking tickets. So what they did is they just looked at the relationship of the home country uh, corruption and related it to the number of parking tickets that people had. And not surprisingly, the country level corruption predicted the not more parking tickets. So people, from, diplomats from more corrupt countries uh, had more parking tickets. What my collaborators, Jonathan Schultz uh, and, uh, and our other collaborators did was we took the intensity of kinship in these different places and we used that and we can even explain the number of parking tickets better. So if you come from a society with tight kinship based on these networks, people tended to accumulate a lot of these parking tickets. You can look at the whole UN delegation or you can look at just a diplomat, same, same answer. Places with small monogamous nuclear families, 
tended not to get very very many of these parts. How come? Well, the idea is that um, when you're uh, when you're from these societies that have these small monogamous nuclear families, you tend to be big on following these impersonal rules. So these kind of invisible institutions that you can see, which is why you might comply with with something like that, even when you're, there's no penalty, um, those things become deeply internalized and we can show in simple experiments that people are more willing to follow these impersonal institutionalized rules. When you're in a society that's based on relationships, your thought, you're always thinking about, well, how are these gonna affect my relationships? And you know, who am I trying to help and who am I trying you know, not to help here? And if the case of it's an impersonal institution, you don't have any particular loyalty or relationship to these impersonal institutions. So that doesn't weigh in your decision making as much. What of the lessons from your book and the analyses from your book are applicable to the problems we now face with Western democracies and Western societies? Well, I think, I mean, if, if I'm analyzing the situation that the US is facing right now, I look at the things that might have shaped people's moral psychology. And so one of the big things that I push in the book is the importance of residential mobility. So people need to move around and not get anchored in these relationships that, that build up social relationships over a long period of time. And if you look at the US, certain segments of the US populations have had a big decline in residential mobility. So people are staying in the same places, they're staying in the same social classes, and uh, this leads to a, the, a, moral, a, a kind of moral psychology that is in conflict with people who are moving around, building new relationships all the time, looking for more egalitarian relationships, not concerned with in-group loyalty. Uh, so that, that, I think, is an important factor in creating this divide in moral psychology that we see in places like the U.S. today. To what extent do you think your research can help us change the way we look at psychology, which, after having read your book, is so focused on people coming into the labs of psychologists and getting tested. And those people all tend to be educated people who end up being tested. And so we've had a blind spot in our psychology. Do you think that should change? Yeah, now what I've been arguing is that we need to have an integrated social science where we have laboratories around the world that run continuously in diverse communities. And we study people across their whole lives. And we, you know, we can run experiments on them, but we should also be interviewing them and keeping track of what they do and how they spend their time. And you know, from childhood all the way to adulthood, rather than just people who are on the internet or uh, people who go to college or something like that. Professor Joseph Henrik, thank you so much for joining us this evening. It was great to be with you. Great to be with you.